We begin this morning with uh, him with accompaniment. But remember, please, no singing, humming along is just fine. This is courtesy of Myers United Church in Ancaster. paints a really good picture of how we handle words of wisdom. My mother had a couple of simple roles when it came to progressing an infant from formula to bait to table food. If a child was always hungry and yet gaining weight, or not sleeping through the night when it was well past the age where they should have been, it was time to move them along to the next step. Formula, or from formula or breastfeeding to formula mixed with a little bit of baby cereal. And then to cereal and then to baby food and of course you do fruits first and then vegetables and finally table food. On the other side the rule was if what came out was the same color as what went in you need to hold back for a time on that particular item and then try it a little bit later. How many of you applied that? <laughs> it works really good. Babies' digestive tract are not built. They have to build up before they can digest certain types of food. If a food was the same color coming out, it wasn't being digested. And therefore, it was of no value to the child and could cause some upset stomach. As odd as it seems, this is also a good guide, good guide, good guideline for how we interact with words of wisdom. If someone gives us advice and we don't digest it, our attitudes and behaviors don't change. That guidance re really just remains a collection of words. Of course, regardless of how true those words may be, if we don't acknowledge there's a problem, we will never correct that problem. And most of you are familiar with the fact that in church language we speak of confession, <clears throat> confession, and then, which is the acknowledgement part, that there is a problem, 
and repentance, which is a change in directions, changing our behavior. Today, the lectionary reading contains two examples of words of wisdom. Not that the other two aren't. But the Ezekiel section is directed at civil and religious leaders. The, the one that we'll read from Matthew towards those that are religiously comfortable. It is the latter that we will concentrate upon since being comfortable is far more appreciated by us than being uncomfortable. <coughs> As usual, uh, good morning. I trust that you've had a good week. I'm Tom Holmes, the minister of the United Church Congregations in Roslyn and in Thomasburg, and welcome to our time of worship and discipleship. Whether you are physically present with us today in Trinity United Church in Roslyn or attending via live stream, please know that you are welcome and that you are loved. For you who are here, Again, the local health unit dictates what we can and cannot do in our physical gatherings. Um, worth noting, of course, is that face masks and six feet of physical distancing are mandatory. And while singing is prohibited, humming and responsive readings are not. Because we are making this service available to anyone who wishes to follow it online, I will not be mentioning last names during our time of prayer. Portions of today's service include materials from ministrymatters.com. All music is either public domain or used under the one license A-737046. We uh, normally begin by focusing our attention, and we do that through a responsive reading. Though the dark clouds cover us and violent storms assail us, God speaks us out and protects us. God brings us to the safe shelter of God's compassion. When we feel lost and alone, wondering who will save us, God reaches out in love, healing our wounds and transforming our lives. Thank God who loves us so much. Praise God who searches for us and brings us home. Amen. Let's pray. Mighty and tender God, voice of the voiceless, power of the powerless, we praise you for your vision of a community of wholeness, a realm of peace, in which all who hunger and thirst are nourished, in which the stranger is welcome, the hurting are healed, and the captives set free. Guide us by your truth and love until all your people and we make manifest your reign of justice and compassion. We pray in the name of the Anointed One, our servant King, to whom with you and the Spirit, one holy God, be honor and glory and blessing this day and forevermore. Amen. And we acknowledge the frailty of our humanity. This is quite a long section for you to read. So, together, merciful God, we get so caught up in our own lives and things that we fail to see others for whom we might be providing for and breathe. You challenge us to be those who are hungry and to quench the thirst of those who are parched. You ask us to bring clothing to those who have none, or for whom the attire is inadequate for the weather. You want us to visit the people who are sick, alone, alienated, those who are imprisoned, either in cells with the bars or in such conditions of hopelessness and poverty that they see no way out. You encourage us to welcome the stranger and reach out to those who are marginalized, to always bring your words to healing and relieving love. We have failed in these tasks. We ignore the opportunities when claiming we are too busy to help, too busy to care. How this attitude must 
Because of God's grace made visible in Jesus Christ, who brings us peace and hope, we are forgiven, healed, and enabled to be part of the ministries of compassion in God's world. Rejoice, for you are chosen and you are loved. Amen. Side of Israel. Babylon was at the borders. They um, had taken exception to the, the current king. And not too long after this passage is written, Ezekiel is carried off to Babylon. In this passage, Ezekiel speaks of judgments against Israel's rich and powerful, of promises of restoration and healing of God's people and announces the Messianic leader to come. 
it begins in uh, <clears throat> chapter 34, verses 11 through 16, and then 20 to 24. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will bring them back, I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the peoples and nations. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and by the rivers and in all the places where people live. Yes, I will give them good pasture land on the high hills of Israel. There they will lie down in pleasant places and feed in the lush pastures on the hill. I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace, says the Sovereign Lord. I will search for my lost ones who strayed away, and I will bring them safely home again. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak, but I will destroy those who are fat and powerful. I will feed them, yes, feed them justice. And then down to verse 20. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will surely judge between the fat sheep and the scrawny sheep. For you fat sheep pushed and buttered and crowded my sick and hungry flock until you scattered them to distant lands. So I will rescue my flock and they will no longer be abused. I will judge between one animal of the flock and another and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. He will feed them and be a shepherd to them. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be a prince among my people. I, the Lord, have spoken. Hear what the Spirit is saying. God. Now we're going to go down to the reading from Matthew, which is found in chapter 25. I just have to catch up with myself. This passage is, in some ways, very similar to the Ezekiel passage. Both point to the fact that conduct has eternal consequences. We are to witness the reign of Christ in the way that we serve him in faithfulness, kindness, and love to our neighbors. Each one of us must ask ourselves, how we are to respond to the opportunities that God constantly gives us. What follows is part of Jesus' response to the question posed to him at the very beginning of chapter 24. What sign will, see, will signal your return and the end of the world? And so we start at verse 31. This is Jesus responding. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and, they will be, and he will separate the people as a shepherd she, separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? 
When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to the least of these, my brethren and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were, were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous will go into eternal life. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have said to you a couple of times that when something, everything in Scripture is important, but when it's repeated, when you see it twice in the same passage, it's, a little, it's really important. And if you see it three times, then it's really, really important that we need to pay attention to it. So, the same thing has been said here four times. What does that tell you? Super big important. Let's pray. God who seeks, reveals, and inspires, open our heart to your whispers. Amen. This morning we have heard two passages read. Ezekiel speaks of God's judgment against those, against those with position, power, and prestige, who took advantage of those who were without rank, strength, or importance. The message goes on to speak of God protecting the flock, the flock of disadvantage, by scattering them and, and caring for them directly as a good shepherd would. It concludes with God speak, it concludes with speaking of God sending a Messiah, an anointed one, a good shepherd who would seek out the lost flock, gather them, lead them, and bless them. In Matthew 24, Jesus is asked the questions around the end of days. And Jesus responds through chapters 24 and 25, and concluding by saying that when he returns, that there will be a great judgment. That judgment of all people only has one basis for judgment, one criteria. How did you treat Jesus? The question both surprises and perplexes those who are asking. And so Jesus explains that how we treat others, our attitudes about them and our conversations with them, is a far greater concern than what we perceive, because Jesus is found in their midst. Our treatment of others is a direct reflection of what we believe about Jesus. While the disadvantaged are mentioned directly, we also should remember that every once in a while we're going to come across someone that is very rich and powerful who requires a kind word or a helping hand or a listening ear. Often we allow ourselves to believe that if there is a judgment, that will be based on our doctrine, what we believe or our religious performance, how many times we got to church. But that's not the overall statement of Scripture, nor especially in these two passages. In Ezekiel, the civic and religious leaders were tasked with caring for the weak. 
Instead, they preyed on the vulnerable to add their own, to add to their own wealth. So God promises to send the good shepherd to find the lost and to lead them into blessing and judge those in authority and punish them for a dereliction of duty. In Matthew, how we treat others is a direct result of our relationship with Christ, a reflection of our personal relational understanding of Christ, who he is and what he's all about, bringing abundant life to all. This thought is nicely summarized in chapter 2 of verse 13 of Philippians. In a new, new international version, it reads this way, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. There are some very stern warnings arise out of these passages. One, if as an individual or as a congregation, we get to the place where we exist only for ourselves, where our main concern is our own comfort, our security, our holy huddle, we need to repent and then ask God for the same thing the writer of, of Ephesians asked for, for the church at Ephesus, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the glorious Father, may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better. The second thing, we have no grounds for thinking of ourselves better than we ought. If it is God who, in both loud voices and in whispers, points us towards reaching out to, to and loving others, to befriending them, to assisting them, to sharing the love of God with them, the most we can say is that we endeavor to be obedient to God's calling. We're not racking up points on some eternal scorecard of good and evil. We are merely doing what is expected of us as followers of Christ. The third one, when we do not listen to those nudgings from within, we are not just making insignificant momentary decisions. We are rebelling against God's plan and making Christ out to be something quite different than who he really is. And finally, if we never sense those nudgings, we're probably not paying attention. It may be that our world's world is so full of clutter coming from the here and now that our religious, that our religious practices are nothing more than habitual exercises. If so, we need to once again be open to God finding us, teaching us, and opening us up to being in relationship with God and participating in God's purposes. The celebration of Reign of Christ Sunday points us to a time when the kingdom of God is no longer something we look forward to. It's not going to be a future event, but it will be a living reality. When that happens, only God the Father knows. What is immediate, what is vital in this question, or is this question, is Christ reigning in, over, and through our lives as individuals and as a congregation right now? If not, it is because we do not take the wisdom of God seriously. We do not allow God's teachings to be digested, changing our attitudes and our actions. Let's pray. Forgive us, God, for not listening, for reducing our world to us for no more, for thinking that we're racking up points when, uh, with you when we do not attempt to touch another's life. Remind us once again of who we are and whose we are. Help us to live as Christ's presence in the here and now. Amen and amen. This is a vi video 
from Jim and Gene Stratton came across this I love this song. Take this heart of mine freely given all the children carry for the planet. Take this heart of mine love God is not Santa Claus without the red costume <clears throat> and with angels instead of reindeer. God is real and can be found when we put into practice, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Our gifts, whether it be to the mission and service fund or local expenses, whether it be cash on the offering plate as you go out or through PAR, um, is a meeting with God face to face.
refusing to allow us to turn away from your people. Your reign is not one of power and privilege, but rather a strange collected of collection of gifted souls in which we in which we are included. Help us to find our place in your realm. Help us to find homes for others who may not even know that they are invited. Help us to use our resources to find places for all of your children. Amen and amen. And only as you're able would you please stand as once again we say the words that are intended to remind us of who it is that we say we are. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, see justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. <laughs> As we go to prayer this morning, Let's remember from our prayer list Pam, Anne, and Dale and Tina of Trinity Raza, Fred and Marie, Bill and Elaine, and Darlene of Thomasburg. Let's also remember Ruby. What's going on with Ruby? She's at the um, nursing home in. Uh, Marmor. I talked to her this week. She sounds very good. She's uh, quite moved in there and uh, has been able to be out and about walking and uh, she sounded really good. But she misses everyone here, certainly. Um, so Ruby is progressing. Is she going to take up permanent residence there? She says she'll be there until I think she said April. Whether that changes then. Okay. Let's also remember Ab and Lynn. I know that that uh, both of them were going for more tests when I talked to Lynn a couple weeks ago. And Sharon's brother Bob. Is Sharon here today? I understand that he's progressing. And all all of all, and all who are suffering from health issues. Let's also be mindful that uh, there is a group that is going to do the exploratory conversations around amalgamation. And so as a group and as individuals and as our discussions progress, we need your prayers for wisdom. Let's also be mindful of the, um, elect the election in the states and the political atmosphere our local, provincial, and national governments, local school boards and health units who are working really hard to try to avoid catastrophe, and all those that have suffered the consequences of the pandemic and those who have suffered the destructiveness of natural disasters. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are so glad that in the scriptures you remind us that love covers a multitude of sins and that you are love. We are so familiar with many of the stories in the Bible that we often lose sight of their greater significance. We get so caught up in our day-to-day -day living that we lose sensitivity to your leading. We worry so much about budgets that we lose our sense of purpose. Help us to do better. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. God of the journey, 
give us a sense that we need not fear the future. It is some place that you have already traveled and have prepared for us. Lord, hear our prayer. And hear God, God, our healer, provider, and protector, you who knows all of our needs, help us. Some of us grow tired and discouraged. Some have health that is in decline. Some have urgent family requirements and, and other ongoing issues. Some of us may face a tomorrow that changes the entire directions of our lives. And some may live with yesterdays that hold us prisoner. For those people and situations we have already mentioned, and those that we bring to you now in the silence of our hearts, Lord, hear our prayer. And hear our All these things we ask in the name of the one who came to us to bring us abundant life and taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Even though we're basically shut down, we still have a few activities. Please remember the food bank, regardless of how things are going, there are always people that are depending on the Tweed Food Bank. At when, on Wednesday at Roslyn, you're invited to a socially distanced and mask gift and grab at the church hall from 10 to 12. Don't forget to bring your own coffee and have a spend some time in a visit apart but at least closer than when you're sitting at home next sunday is the first sunday of advent traditionally on at advent we not only do uh, candle lighting liturgies etc etc but the first sunday of advent we set aside as a communion sunday Given our current circumstances, we cannot do our traditional um, communion service. So I'm going to ask you once again that when you come next week, would you please bring your own elements, some juice and bread or cracker or whatever, uh, and that way we can fully participate. This again is courtesy of Ryan's Community Church.
are sought out. We are gathered together. We are taught. We are healed. We are protected. And most important, we are loved. And now, we are sent out. Let's not forget.